And Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. All righty. Well, thank you, Molly, for all of your help in setting this up. It has been a huge help just having your support in this. And welcome to everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us to talk about a project that has become very near and dear to my heart over the past year, which is the Castle Neck River Restoration Project, um, which is currently going on at the border of Ipswich and Essex. My name is Sarah Dawson, and I am the Restoration Project Manager at the Ipswich River Watershed Association. And I'm going to be your presenter tonight, um, but I'll also be joined by Frank Ventimiglia at the town of Ipswich. So before I jump straight into the project, I do want to just give a bit of context. Um, so the Great Marsh has experienced more frequent flooding in the past 50 years than ever before. And in many cases, the flooding has been made worse by outdated and inadequate infrastructure. And the main culprit being undersized culverts. As can be seen in the photo on the screen, the width of this culvert is roughly only a third of the width of the stream itself. This is incredibly restrictive to stream flow and can make road crossings very, very vulnerable to flooding. And in the 2022 Climate Change Assessment Report, um, which is shown on the screen, the Massachusetts state government identified the North Shore as being incredibly vulnerable to infrastructure damage related to sea level rise, particularly for coastal buildings, roads, and ports. Um, and for people who might not be familiar, the North Shore includes every coastal community from Revere to Salisbury. And Pertaining to this project, two of those coastal communities in the North Shore, namely Ipswich and Essex, identified many of the same top hazards in their municipal vulnerability preparedness reports. And for people who might not be familiar with what that is, most towns have to fill out those reports to just kind of identify what hazards their communities face. And so the hazards that both of these towns identified in their reports include coastal flooding from storms and sea level rise, freshwater flooding caused by severe precipitation events and improperly sized culverts, as well as coastal erosion. And so now I'm going to hand it off to Frank at the Ipswich DPW to talk a little more about the project's background and how it became a priority for the town of Ipswich. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so again, I, my name is Frank Ventimiglia. I work with the Ipswich DPW. I'm the operations manager. Um, this particular project was brought to conception more or less by the residents of the Old Essex Road. Um, now we're working on several projects around town. Um, you know, this one they brought to us, which was interesting, not um, so the town isn't always on the forefront of, of making the decisions. So they came to us with concerns over um, speeding traffic through the neighborhood. Uh, I'm familiar with the culvert at the town line, and uh, the town recently had closed the street in town, uh, PBD Street, for those of you who are familiar. Um, and I thought this might be a good chance to not just close the street, but also do a habitat restoration project. Um, so that, at that point, we were talking with Erwa about the different grants that are available, and we identified this as a potential uh, MVP grant. Um, so the goal of the project, again, is to remove the culvert at Old Essex Road to create additional um, like flood capacity for that area. And we're also going to be looking at the culvert on the Old Essex, uh, on the Essex Road 133 to see if that can be improved to con convey a uh, complete tidal exchange on the uh, 133 where the greater benefit will be. Um, so that's the gist of it from my perspective. Again, it's more of um, the, the residents brought it to us. They wanted to get the road closed. We thought it would be a good opportunity to, again, not just close the road, but couple it by removing the culvert 
and doing a wetland restoration in that area. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Um, so pretty much what Frank just said is that is a priority for the town of Ipswich to address this location um, because the residents themselves brought up that they wanted something to be done about this area. And so then the town came to us and we kind of went over what grants would be applicable. And so we applied for the MVP grant and in August of 2023, the town of Ipswich was awarded the MVP grant in conjunction with the town of Essex. And the purpose of the grant in general is to offer financial assistance for communities to address and prepare measures for climate adaptation. And so there are 10 core principles that must be addressed in MVP funded projects, which you can see on the slide. I'm not going to specifically call these 10 principles out. Uh, this, pre this presentation will touch on each of them and how they fit into this project, but I'm not gonna specifically um, say what, which, um, core principle I'm going to be talking about on each slide. So now that we've kind of covered the background of the grant itself and kind of how this project came um, into existence, let's get into the actual details of the project itself. So as Frank was saying, it's going to address two high priority coastal barriers in an area that is at high risk for sea level rise, storm surge, and extreme precipitation. And although this is a relatively undeveloped area, Castle Neck River and its associated salt marsh are significantly impaired by man-made barriers, namely just where the roads crisscross over the river and the marsh. Both the Old Essex barrier, the Old Essex road barrier, and and the Route 133 barrier were given a high priority in the Great Marsh Bears assessment based on their environmental restoration potential, just meaning that if we addressed them, restored them um, in, a, in a way that's beneficial to the environment, the, the benefits they will have are very, very high. And so for some background, the Great Marsh Bears assessment was a report resulting from a comprehensive review of all the road crossings disrupting river and coastal processes within the Great Marsh. So for people who are familiar with the Great Marsh, you can guess that this is a very big document. And to go more into why this is a big deal, roads fragment the marsh and interrupt natural tidal processes, which harms the ability of the marsh to function especially as habitat and moreover as forage habitat for fish. In smaller streams, such as Castle Neck River, you'd expect to find small forage fish, such as mummy chugs and silver sides, which are prey for larger species like striped bass and even Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon. However, the Old Essex Road and Route 133 crossings currently discourage the presence of those small forage fish species in the Castle Neck River system. And so this project will restore flow of the river, as well as restoring the tides and allowing for marsh migration. All in all, um, is going to enable forage fish species to return. And so specifically, the money from this grant is going to be used to develop permit level design plans for abandoning the section of Old Essex Road over Castle Neck River and the surrounding marsh, as well as begin the permitting process. And so the next few slides are going to show you pictures of the culvert after a precipitation event and at high tide to illustrate the need, <clears throat> pardon me, the need for it to be addressed. So this is a picture of the outlet of the culvert after almost two inches of rain um, overnight and during high tide. And as you can see, the culvert is almost totally submerged. And in the next picture, you're going to see the inlet of the culvert. And as you can see, it's also pretty much submerged to the top. And here there's also noticeable clogging from salt marsh hay, which has fallen into the stream and is now collecting 
in the the inlet of the culvert and kind of acting as like a choking point of the stream itself. And then the next picture is also going to be at the inlet of the culvert. It actually shows a crack at the top of the structure, which allows you to see into the culvert, which really shouldn't happen. Um, this culvert is very old. It's uh, probably over a hundred years old, but um, I don't know the exact age, but it's well past its lifespan and it's going to become less and less stable over time. So this poses a large risk to the entire section of the road above, as well as any cars or pedestrians that travel it. Because if the structure itself is already experiencing deformities, as we continue to use the road, any pressure on the road can cause issues to the culvert underneath the road. And if it experiences failure, it's going to bring down the road with it. So the MVP grant money is not only going to address the barrier at Old Essex Road, but it's also going to be used to produce an alternatives analysis for the replacement of the existing culvert under Route 133, or just Essex Road. Like before, the next few slides are going to show you pictures of the culvert after that same precipitation event and at high tide to show you why this one needs to be upgraded. And so like before, this is a picture of the outlet of the culvert. Uh, this culvert's different. This one is a metal pipe rather than kind of a stone culvert like the one under Old Essex Road. But once again, it's after 1.96 inches of rain had fallen in the area um, and it's during high tide. And just like at Old Essex Road, the culvert is almost totally submerged. And the next picture is going to show, um, this is right off of the outlet of the culvert. You can see significant marsh subsidence, which just means that the marsh there has been artificially flooded so frequently by the undersized culvert that the marsh platform has given way entirely. And this is a huge issue across the entire Great Marsh as many of the road culverts are too small to accommodate the rivers and streams that they're supposed to allow to pass under the road. So this is a big issue that you can see across much of the marsh. And the next picture is, it shows the inlet um, on the same day. And once again, you can see it's pretty much submerged to the top with only a few inches sticking above the surface of the water. And so some of you might be wondering, when we're talking about Old Essex Road, why are we talking about road abandonment? Why not just replace the culvert at Old Essex Road like we're planning on doing at Route 133? And so I wanna talk a little bit about what road abandonment is and kind of where it comes from. And so it stems from the same vein of thought as managed retreat. And managed retreat was a term coined only several decades ago, but it has been a concept in practice for over a hundred years. And generally speaking, it involves the purposeful movement of people and infrastructure away from risks. In regards to climate change, it is most often associated with sea level rise. And so it is a relatively newly recognized coastal management strategy which allows for human development to be moved out of harm's way while natural coastal habitats are allowed to be restored in order to act as a natural buffer against flooding. Basically, managed retreat allows the shoreline, the shoreline to move inland instead of trying to hold the line with structural engineering. So think of like seawalls. Both managed retreat and road abandonment despite their connotation, are not the same as giving up. They are simply additional tools to use towards climate adaptation and mitigation. So we have contracted Conoco engineers and scientists to produce preliminary designs for the abandonment and removal of the section of Old Essex Road over the Great Marsh, as well as produce an alternatives analysis for replacing the existing culvert at Route 133. 
And so the first round of draft designs have been completed for Old Essex Road. And I've included a screenshot of um, one page of those designs on the slide for you to see. And right now they're currently undergoing the revision process. The alternatives analysis for Route 133 is almost done being drafted, but both the designs and the alternatives analysis are slated to be finalized within the next few months. So this project can build community capacity for climate resilience by connecting nearby residents' concerns with larger town-wide resilience efforts. This is kind of exactly what Frank was talking about before. And as he mentioned, neighbors of the project site were the ones to initially approach the town of Ipswich about abandonment of Old Essex Road due to traffic concerns. So this project not only addresses their concerns, but it also directly incorporates, incorporates the top resilience recommendations from each town's MVP report, which can be seen on this slide. And both the town's reports recommend protecting land to allow for marsh migration, to upgrade or replace vulnerable culverts, and to make coastal roads more resilient to climate change related impacts. And this project will not only positively impact the towns of Ipswich and Essex as a whole, but it will also help local vulnerable communities. Both Ipswich and Essex are home to several priority populations. And these are groups of people who are just, quote, disproportionately impacted by climate change due to life circumstances that systematically increase their exposure to climate hazards or make it harder to respond. This is just kind of a metric of the state. And as can be seen on the slide, the priority populations in Essex and Ipswich include those with disabilities, those age 65 or older, people who are 65 and up that live by themselves, and people who have no access to a car. And because this project decreases overall vulnerability for both towns, it indirect, indirectly helps protect these priority communities from climate adversity. So now we've talked a lot about how this project will benefit the communities, but I wanna get into the nitty gritty of the why and I apologize, this part is a little bit nerdy and it's a little bit numbers focused, but just bear with me. So both the culverts at Route 133 and Old Essex Road are located in FEMA flood zone AE, meaning that they're at a high risk for flooding and have an infrastructure base flood elevation requirement of 10 feet. That's even hard for me to say, but it's just a fancy way of saying infrastructure needs to be built in order to, in order to withstand a flood of 10 feet. The elevation of Old Essex Road is about 9.6 feet and Route 133 is about 10.8 feet. And so these road elevations are plotted on the slide against the current average low and high tide elevations. For Old Essex Road, the average tidal elevation for 2030 is projected to reach 9.4 feet. So this is right at that base flood elevation that I mentioned, and it's only slightly lower than the road itself. So this means that in major precipitation events or coastal storms, the water level is likely going to rise above the road and flood it, which can cause major damage to the road and harm to anyone using it. And in case I didn't make this clear before, this is assuming we don't do anything, we don't replace the culvert. And then the other graphic shows projected water surface elevation. What this term means is um, it refers to the maximum height of flooding during a one in 1000 year flood event. So this is a 0.1% chance annual flood event. So it just means that every single year there's a 0.1% chance of this happening. So it means that water surface elevation at the Route 133 crossing over Castleneck River is projected to reach 11.7 feet by 2030, 13.8 feet by 2050, and 15.4 feet by 2070, all exceeding that base flood elevation I mentioned before 
and the elevation of the road itself. So if this occurs, the road will experience extreme flooding, as you can see in that graphic, which impairs its ability to function, its structural integrity, and the safety of commuters. And this next slide is going to show you a graphic that's been produced by the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management, um, otherwise known as CZM. They produced this model in order to explore the simulated effect of sea level rise on our coastal wetlands. So currently in these baseline conditions based on um, a 2011 survey, most of the wetlands in the area of Castleneck River are classified as high marsh, which is shown in kind of that light green color. But then these next four pictures on the slide represent four different scenarios that we could be seeing by the year 2070. Low sea level rise conditions, intermediate low conditions, intermediate high conditions, and high sea level rise conditions. As we can see across the worsening sea level rise scenarios, tidal fresh marsh, which is depicted in pink, disappears more and more while much of the existing high marsh, which is in that light green color, is increasingly replaced by low marsh, which is in teal. This slide illustrates the effect of the shoreline moving in, which I talked about earlier as part of the rationale behind managed retreat. And this is otherwise known as marsh migration. Marsh migration is crucial for the long-term health of the Great Marsh and its resilience to climate change. And as we kind of hinted at before, it is defined as the conversion of neighboring inland habitats into marshlands. And it's a completely natural process that happens in order to allow salt marshes to survive in the face of sea level rise. And planning for marsh migration is a crucial component for the long-term health of the Great Marsh. As sea levels rise and marshland migrates landward, advanced steps need to be taken to, to build resiliency in preparation for a changing climate. Conservation and preservation of the existing marsh and its surrounding areas are critical first steps in making the Castleneck salt marsh more resilient, but direct restoration is also needed. And that's where this project comes in. This project will directly create over 5,000 square feet of new salt marsh with the southernmost stretch of Old Essex Road currently sits. And so climate change is not confined to town boundaries. As we can see, this project literally is occurring on the border of two towns. Um, and the wide reaching impacts of climate change kind of necessitate the need for regional action. And this project came as a result of many regional studies and research efforts. The Great Marsh Barriers Assessment, which I've kind of talked about a couple times now, the Great Marsh Coastal Adaptation Plan, and the Parker Ipswich Essex Rivers Restoration Partnership Action Plan, or otherwise called Pi Rivers. This project will not only reduce local transportation vulnerability, but it will increase the resilience of a state road that services nine towns across two counties. The proposed marsh restoration at this site will benefit the Great Marsh as a whole, including all eight towns in the Great Marsh. And this project will be readily transferable to the 29 municipalities that are in the Pi Rivers region especially the coastal communities where this type of work will be increasingly common. As one of the first ever road abandonment projects, it will serve as an example for all communities across the Great Marsh of a project designed specifically to reduce climate vulnerability and restore habitat connectivity in the Great Marsh. And although rarely implemented, Road abandonments are becoming increasingly pertinent for communities in the Great Marsh with road crossings that are susceptible to sea level rise. On the slide, this is a photo from Newberry where that road gets flooded quite often. I think that's just at high tide. 
So infrastructure abandonment is often a very difficult conversation to have with residents and stakeholders. So having a case study to point to is invaluable for future discussions. And that's what we are aiming to do with this project is to be that case study for others to point to. So thank you so much for attending this webinar presentation and we will now be answering questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, to everyone on the call, you are able to unmute yourself, raise your hand, ask a question, type a question in the chat. Um, we'd love to, to take some questions from you. And Hello, you my, name is, uh, oh, oops, my oh, name is, sorry. My name is Brad Rain. Hi, my name is uh, Brad Rainville. I'm just wondering if this um, recording will be available to folks on the call here so we can take a look at it again. Yes, um, Sarah, I believe we will be posting it on the project website after yep. it is finished. So you, we can send out the link to all the attendees as well. So you can um, get a direct link to that too. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, what's the project website? Are we, do we have access to that yet? Uh, it is on the Erwa website. Um, we can also include a link directly to the um, project website in a follow-up email. You can also find it in a couple different places. The town of Ipswich also has a, um, a project website uh, okay. for this project. Um, as well as, a, as as the Pie Rivers website. So it's located in a few different places, but we can definitely point you um, to one of those places to, to find more information. Thank you so much. That'd be very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you for all the hard work you did on this. It's a, it was an amazing presentation, and I'm really happy that uh, the town was able to get the MVP grant and hopefully put this project forward to be um, a case study for the rest of the, the area. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I see a question in the chat, Sarah. Um, will the marsh restoration help buy more time for the folks who are living right next to where the restoration will take place? Yes, it will. Um, the marsh is kind of our number one protector against sea level rise and climate change because it acts as a natural buffer to kind of absorb rising sea levels and storm surges but it's not you know it's not a forever fix it's going to continue to migrate and eventually people who live next to this area in i don't know how many years in the future but eventually where they live might need to naturally become more marsh in order to continue to protect the rest of the coast so for now, yes, it will definitely help protect the people who live nearby, but I wouldn't say that's a forever solution. And another question, do we have a, a timeline of the project? Yes. So this grant, um, the MVP grant, is going to last until June 30th of this year. And what we're expecting to get out of the grant is um, we're going to have the design plans for Old Essex Road, uh, and we're going to start the permitting process for that particular site. And we're going to have the alternatives analysis for Route 133. We also have a federal NOAA grant for the implementation of Old Essex Road. So hopefully by the end of 2025, we'll actually see the road abandonment take place. Um, and we'll see a conceptual design be produced for Route 133. So out of those alternatives analysis, out of the options on the alternatives analysis, one will be chosen and brought to conceptual designs. And then hopefully beyond 2025, we'll find further funding to then do something about that crossing. But by the end of 2025, we will see Old Essex Road be removed, barring you know anything major happening and altering the timeline. 
Great. Um, another question, and this is for the 133 culvert. What are some of the concepts for the 133 culvert type design, size, et cetera? I know you said that they were in process. Mm -hmm. So I don't know a ton of the details yet, but definitely um, things like box culvert. Um, I know they're thinking about doing like a bridge and a bridge is really just, I think it's beyond like 13 or 14 feet of the width is considered a bridge. So they're looking at things of, you know, 12 feet, I think would be considered a culvert. And then, you know, once you start getting beyond that, it's considered a bridge, but just kind of like different widths, different shapes of the culvert, but um, nothing, you know, like crazy different. It's really just experimenting with what widths um, can you work with and seeing if they're going to like majorly change hydrology and things like that. And a different question. Is I there just, anything that could prevent yes. the old Essex road project from happening? Hi, this is Peter. Um, oh, Peter. There's some delay between the Old Essex Road and the 133 opening, I would imagine that the um, granite culvert, undersized as it is, not only traps water up inside, but is there a concern that when you open up that culvert that you're going to cause more flooding on the Route 133 prior to the um, whatever the results of the study show should be done there? That is a consideration. And so that's going to be part of the conceptual designs is anticipating that and thinking about if it were to go to the next stage of designs, what kind of modeling um, are you going to have to do? So it's for this stage, it's not something that's being, that's, it doesn't have a huge amount of weight, but it is something that's being considered and it is taking note and it is saying, it's basically a note that's saying like, these are the design choices, but you have to take into account that things might change once this happens. So it's a consideration yeah. for the I future, think, yeah. I think they'll definitely change and um, it's probably important to to consider that. And I don't know, whether the, you might need to delay the first one or, or at least have a plan and you know hope that nothing happens in the interim years between the, the first culvert and the second culvert because there will be more water coming in you know that because you're opening it up of course and now it's there's the restriction is is not allowing 133 to flood as often as it probably would um, if it was a natural flow to it so something to really consider I think yeah, no, that's true. And I think, um, you know, we are anticipating having to do more modeling uh, in order to, you know, make sure that all the infrastructure is going to be okay, you know, once implementation is carried out. Yeah, it could be um, justification for doing the two projects in tandem from the funders. Mm, that's a good point. I guess on that same line, a question in the chat about, is there anything that could prevent the old Essex Road project from happening? I assume that means happening all the way to completion. Yeah, I guess I would say, you know, even though we have all the funding in place, I would say is if, you know, down the road, have I think we need to produce things that kind of show that other infrastructure is going to be okay, that flooding is not going to get significantly worse upstream, um, and just making sure that we're accounting for that. And, you know, we might be asked to do more modeling, to do more H&H &H studies, um, which, you know, I think we're well equipped to do, but if 
for whatever reason, someone asked for something that we couldn't provide and it was of concern and of enough concern that they thought there would be more harm than good done by the project, that would be enough to stop it. But I really don't foresee that happening. I think, you know, everyone who has a stake in this project would do the work to make sure that we have all of our bases covered and that we do everything um, and think about all aspects in order to make sure that this project can go forward. So even if that means taking extra time, needing more money, um, and just kind of going the extra mile. Thanks, hey, Sarah, that's great. Uh, Follow-up question, uh, who is we? So I think you named all the project partners in the beginning, but if you don't mind doing that again. Yep, so at this stage with the MVP grant, it's, it's Irwa, it's the town of Ip Ipswich, and the town of Essex is um, a, a, a partner. Um, Mass DOT is a partner, but they, um, they've been consulted with, but will be brought along, they'll be brought into the fold um, further along when we have something more concrete to give them, like once the alternatives analysis is further finalized. Um, but I'd say those are kind of like the major project partners at this stage of the project. Great, thank you. And you mentioned also that this was, um, is it one of the first or the first potential road abandonment project that the MVP program has funded? Mm-hmm. I don't know about in the entire state, but I think at least for the North Shore, um, to my knowledge, this is one of the first. It's definitely been talked about for a long time, but I think this is the first to kind of come to fruition. All right, anybody else, any? Any last questions? If you think of some questions later, don't worry, we will send a follow-up email and we will have contact information there as well as um, links to the website. Oh, and here's a permitting related question. How and when will the Conservation Commission be involved? Um, that actually might be a better question for Frank because I'm not entirely sure. Uh, depending on the status of the plans at the end of June, um, we'll make a determination whether we file now or wait until maybe the next round of grant funding to file. Um, if we file too soon, it's not overly helpful because there's only a three-year window for the notice of intent order a condition. So we just got to keep that in mind. But I would, I would think maybe as early as June, you might see filings to the commissions. All right, thank you. Last call for questions, thoughts. Well, thank you, Sarah, for this um, awesome presentation. This was really great. Um, for everyone, we will, again, send out a link to the recording as well as the project website and with contact information so that you can follow up if you have additional questions, learn more if you would like to. Um, and thank you also to Frank on the call as well. Uh, we really appreciate your attendance tonight and uh, hope everyone has a good night. If there's anything else, Sarah? Uh, no, I just want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Molly again for just being a wonderful moderator and helping on the on the tech side and the organization side. And I hope everyone has a really good night. All right. Thank you as well. Appreciate the time. Take care. Okay.